about thinking. What is a thought? Where is a thought? Are thoughts just chemistry in our brains? Or is the mind something more than the physical? Where are you? In London. In Lady Mark's school. London. I'm at school. In England. <laughs> On the bench here. Talking to you. Where are you thinking? In my brain. My brain. In my eyes. In my eyes. In the head. In my brain. What is a thought? Thought is when your brain thinks like a nerve. It's a moment in your brain. When you picture something in your mind, I suppose. It's a bit like a, a bubble that goes into your mind each step by step that you think. I think it's just something that happens, well, it's just like anything else, but it's just more complicated because we haven't really found out about it. Do you think it's possible thought might be just a, a, a chemical movement? It could be. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, probably. Yeah, I suppose so. Yeah. I don't think so. Then what, what is it then? I don't know, I think maybe it's triggered off by the chemicals in your brain, but the chemicals aren't what make you see things, are they? If you know what I mean. Hmm. I did know what he meant, but I didn't have any answers. These questions aren't just hard for kids. They even baffle the world's greatest scientists and philosophers. We may understand more about our brains, but there's one central mystery that defies us. It's the riddle of how we are conscious. So what does consciousness mean? It's the show going on inside your head. It's the experience of sensations. From the sounds you hear, to the words you read, to the taste of a good cup of tea. And it's more than that as well. It's also feeling fear, falling in love, everything from agony to ecstasy. I think it's time to tell you about a little experiment I've been conducting in my basement. You may find it hard to believe, but I'm not asking you to believe. I'd much rather you supposed. Yeah, <laughs> so, uh, believing, I mean, it's really such a sort of narrow spectrum affair, isn't it? I, I believe this. Well, I, I don't believe that and the sort of thing. Whereas, if you suppose, I mean, I'm just, just thinking, even just for a moment, you suppose something. I mean, that surely is a, a, a mind-opening, mind-widening experience. Anyway, not so long ago, I actually really supposed a big one. I suppose that my brain was not in my head, but in there, in that vat. Why? Well, because I've been using my brain for 55 years and I've not known how it worked. I mean, ask yourself this. Where was I? Was I upstairs in my body or was I downstairs in there just thinking I was upstairs? You may think that these are only problems that you run into if you're potty enough to suppose that your brain's in a vat. But actually, where's your brain? floating around in silence, in liquid, in a bone dome you call your skull. And does your brain have any uh, connection, direct connection with the outside world? No, it doesn't. The only connection it has is through long kind of wires called nerves. Anyway, I just thought, in this age of the cordless phone, why not have a cordless brain? Over the next few weeks, I intend to meet enough brains to fill a bathtub. Together, 
We will endeavor to conquer consciousness. I've been driving for, I don't know, that must be 40 miles. And actually, I can't remember any of it. It's amazing how the autopilot clicks in without you even being aware that you've handed over control. I mean, who's in charge here? How come my brain's not telling me what I'm up to? Brain? Yes, Ken, here I am. How can I be of service? Or don't just keep me on automatic pilot. From now on, I want to hear everything you're up to. OK, I'll see what I can do then. Blood to the liver, foot on the crutch, heart a little faster, please. Activate triceps, loading your hands, red alert, swivel Let's go, go to the ready angle and accelerate. Mm -hmm. Simulator mm -hmm. valves open, come on, kidneys. Thanks, sir, have your fluid stimulate, send it to the canal, so just O2 and take it from the Hey, okay, I get the message. Just tell me the important stuff. Your brain's divided into two mm. halves down the middle here. Yeah. Each half is joined to the other by a sort of information superhighway in the middle, yeah. which uh, communicates that, one side with the other. Is that the corpus callosum? That's the corpus callosum, yes, that's correct. The bit on the surface, as it were, the newest bit, is yeah. the cortex. So you've got... What do you mean by newest bit? Newest for man? Newest for man, yes. Newest right. in terms of evolution. Yeah. And the, there's an important sort of gap down the side of the this part of the frontal cortex and along the sides of this yeah. are the areas which control movement. So yeah. this, the right side of your brain, would control the left side of your body's movement. Oh right. Well, so if, if my uh, skull was off yes. and, you, and you pushed a bit there, then that yeah. my left leg would go Absolutely off. right, yes, and that can be done. Right. Close to the movement area and integrated with it are the sensory yeah. areas. Yeah. And none of these things are completely clearly defined. You can move some bits and feel things and you can uh, the whole thing is mixed up together. Move what bits? Bits of the brain? Bits of the brain, yes. And then you can get sensations oh, really? down the other well, side of you. Or yeah. you, I can touch a bit and that looks uh, sensory. Would you mean by move, move it? What, you'd, you'd pick a bit of it up and Yeah, I could, if your skull really? was off I could uh, touch it with a little yeah. probe and a little bit of electricity, yeah. make it jump. Now these experiments have actually been done. Leslie Bromley told me that back in the 60s a Canadian gent called Wilder Penfield exposed the brains of epileptic patients and he prodded around inside while they were still conscious. Ready? And now? And I put the electrode in the same spot, and you said, I hear the music. Tell us what you heard. Well, I heard what sounded like an orchestra playing, and I asked the nurse where it was coming from, where, and she said, what music? And I said, well, that music, and then it stopped. And then I, I stimulated it again, you remember, and asked you about it, and you hummed it. Will you hum it now? You remember it? Yes. Yeah. Go ahead. Da, 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 da. Da, 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 da. Yes, and then when you got to that point, Miss, the nurse exclaimed, I know what it is, it's rolling along together. And you said what? And I said, yes, that's what it is. <laughs> Let's hope that this patient is soon in good shape again. Like Doris, whom as you've seen, is happy and cheerful and back at work. Rather Doris than me. It seems that by zapping a few neurons, you can trigger anything from the sound of music to the taste of mashed potato. Luckily, the investigations of my own brain are only scratching the surface. Underneath this movement area, the, the nerves flow down into the deeper bit of the brain. Yeah. And part of the movement is integrated by the little brain or the cerebellum, which is at the back here. Yeah. And that's also very important in integrating movement. Is that a reptile brain? No, the reptile brain is deep underneath. If I were to put my pencil through here, yeah. I'd have to draw a line inside the cortex. Yeah. That includes the, the sense of smell. The nerves for the sense of smell come right down here through the... And the, one the reptile brain is, is like a remnant of what? 
man had when he was reptilian. Oh yes, it's like a crocodile brain. Right. And because reptiles... Well, is there a, then there's a kind of monkey brain after that, is there? Yeah, there's a, your brain develops in, in the same way as evolution yeah. has developed. So the, the deepest, oldest bits, yeah. like the reptile brain, have a lot of th the sensation like smell is associated with those because reptiles right. use their sense of smell a lot. Is, and then that the, is, that the, is, that, is that the oldest one? Or is that's the, the oldest bit, yeah. Fish one under there. Really? No, 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 no. You've got right. some fish bits in your neck, but the, your brain is mostly, right. mostly reptile. What, what are the fish bits in my neck? Uh, as you form, there are arches in your neck which are like the gills of a fish. And then they really? close over and become the normal muscles of your neck because you're a mammal and you've um, evolved. In this motor area yeah. down here, there's a bit that controls your speech, the bit that's sometimes lost in a stroke. The things that you don't think about are controlled down here in the brain stem. That's things like breathing and keeping your heart going at the right rate, uh, things like that which you don't actually have to consciously remember to do all the time. Mm. They're done automatically. So, I mean, if we go back thousands of years, then I was just this just that bit. reptile. Yeah, just the bit. Without any bothers really, but... That's right, just the brain around. stem and then the little bit that you, the, that you smell with. That's and then I'd stop being in the water so much. Yep. The blood got a bit warmer. You dried out. And, and, and kaboom! Blimey! I'm like a walking Noah's Ark. I'm off to see a psychiatrist, Dr. Anthony Stevens. I wonder whether he'd think the human psyche is like the contents of a pet shop. I mean, the human psyche has taken all this time to evolve, this slow, lumbering process through reptilian brains, mammalian brains, ape brains, to, to us. And we've carried with us all that kind of potential experience. Yeah. You know, it's often said by analysts that when a patient walks into the room, talks to you, she brings a whole crowd of people with her. Yeah. And it's true, she does. Yeah. But what, what, until recently, we hadn't realized is that she brings in a horse and a crocodile as well. <laughs> Which is worse than I thought. But why did consciousness evolve in my brain? What is it there for? Even that highly evolved brain Richard Dawkins is haunted by this question. I mean, I know I'm conscious, but I don't know you're conscious and vice versa. I guess that you're conscious because mm. you're obviously the same kind of thing as I am. Mm. And you've come into the world by the same kind of process as I have. Mm. And so that's how I'm absolutely confident that you're conscious. Mm. And it's the same kind of reasoning that I would use for, say, chimpanzees, or dogs, or kangaroos. But equally, I know that there are other kinds of animals mm. which I would bet almost certainly are not conscious. Like what? Um, well, um, I don't want to be snobbish and name them. I mean, I'd rather, I'd rather say <laughs> that the process of evolution took yeah. a very long time. Yeah. And I'm absolutely sure consciousness wasn't there at the start. And so, consciousness probably... Consciousness was not there at the start. I'd be very surprised it's, if it was. It's crept in. Yes. By what... Everything creeps in. That's right. what evolution's about. Evolution right. is all about things creeping in. By some in, chance conjunction of fluids. By, by the normal process of evolution. Something like the normal process of evolution. Mm. Now, I'm, I'm not going to be... Uh, Gave us and, and chimpanzees and dogs. Yeah, and but I'm not going to be bullied into saying which animals are conscious and which, and which are not. What I will say is that mm. I'm quite sure that the first bacteria, which are our universal ancestors, mm. were not conscious. And I'm quite sure that we are. I couldn't persuade Dawkins to separate the sheep from the goats. Perhaps the keepers at London Zoo will be more prepared to stick their necks out. Yeah, hello. Yeah, Frank Wheeler looks after the Saki monkeys. These guys really, kn they, they, they know who they are, don't oh, they? Oh yes, they do, yeah. yeah you, you get into much, much smarter range of animals with, uh, with the, the monkeys. That they've got very highly complex brains. They feel fear. They feel pain. They, they, they feel loss if they lose a baby. They fall in love. Well, these type of monkey pair bond. They live, they live all their life as a pair. So yes, a lot of their emotions are, mm. you, you can you can mirror to human emotions. Frank had convinced me his monkeys were conscious. But how would Esther Wenman fare in her defence of Herbert's colourful personality? Is that thing conscious in the way that you are? Well, no. I mean, mm. they're not going to have a range of emotions that 
we as humans have. They're no. not going to have the range of uh, thought processes and decision making abilities. No. Do they make decisions though? Yeah, they, they make do. decisions. Yeah, yeah they okay. make a lot of decisions. And like it could do this, it could do that, and yeah. sadly it made the wrong decision, but yeah. it's not kind of programmed in. No. I'm going to do that. Yeah, no, there is an element of risk and an element of um, mistake making, I'm sure. Yeah, you reckon he knows, then he knows I'm here? Yeah. You yeah. reckon? Yeah. Right. <coughs> but it does, does he really know I'm here? Does he know he, know, does he, know he, he knows I'm here? <laughs> yeah, he does. There's no sense, surely, in which any of these ants know that we're looking at them, do they? Certainly not looking at them. They yeah. will react really quickly if there's any kind of interaction with them. Well, do, do you think that they um, feel pain? Actually feel it? Do they experience pain? This was going to test Paul Kelly's loyalty to his little friends. Again, that's a difficult thing to answer. I think to a degree you can say that they will vigorously uh, react to... Um, vigorous stimuli, be it uh, squashing or whatever. Yeah. You, you know those ones where um, the missus eats the husband yes, after yeah. they've had it off? Yeah, with the mantids and things. Yes. There. there was some, um, another sort over there. I, was, I can't think where it was. It? Yeah. It, yeah, does the husband mind, do you think? That's what they are instinctively programmed to do, and they will do it. Yeah. Not to say that that happens every single time, and you know, things happen all the time. Which I really want some some gentleman mantises get away. Well, uh, uh, yes, I mean, oh, indeed, yes. Do you think they're happier if they get away? I, I, I think I think, that got away. I think whatever level you're working on, you'd have to end up being happier, wouldn't you? Getting. <laughs> I can't say that even uh, the most simple life form would uh, relish being scoffed. No, do you? I mean, do you feel if things are going, if things are going well here, that there's a happiness emanating from the totality of this colony? Happiness is your word, not mine. I wouldn't say no. that. Uh, no, again, you're really putting you're putting too much into what's going on here. So the monkeys were conscious. The lizard, maybe. The ants. Sorry, Paul. I don't think so. But where do you draw the line? It's got a lot to do with nervous systems. Presumably it's got a lot to do with nervous systems getting big. Mm -hmm. But um, I'm not going to say that when a nervous system gets beyond a certain stage, it mm -hmm. sort of goes critical and suddenly becomes conscious. Or I don't know whether that happened, or I don't know whether um, uh, worms are ever Could so slightly conscious. When it gets beyond a certain stage, is this when it gets more and more complicated, more and more things added to it. There's a moment well, when... This could be one point of view, that that um, that it, it's something that happens when nervous systems get beyond a certain magnitude of, of, right. um, of a sort of Can critical it, threshold. So consciousness, I have a come and go feeling with it. Sometimes I feel like I, I know something of what it is and then uh, I doubt it. How do you... Well, join the club, yes, I uh, quite agree. Uh. Um, I mean, you can make all this story about complicated behaviour and how it needs brains to control it. Much more complicated than anything that I've talked about. Yeah. Um, but you still find a hard time convincing yourself that it really has to be conscious in the sense that the animal knows subjectively inside itself, yeah. as you know inside yourself and I know inside yeah. myself. Um, you could imagine making a very, very complicated machine, mm. computer, mm. which behaved in all the ways that were necessary to survive in a very complicated environment mm. so that the animal never puts a foot wrong, the creature, the robot, never puts a foot wrong and it still isn't obvious why it has to be subjectively conscious. So it, if you stick a pin in it, yeah. it may scream but that doesn't mean it's conscious either because it could just be programmed to scream when you stick a pin in it. Yeah. So um, it's, it's the, I suppose all I'm trying to say is that it's a very difficult problem. Perhaps a few frames of pool would shed some light on this mystery. I'd found a good opponent on these matters, a philosophy graduate and pool shark, David the Hurricane Glover. If we say something like, kind of, why do giraffes have long necks? There is yeah. an evolutionary explanation why it's good for them to evolve long necks. Tall trees. Tall trees, exactly, yeah. But in terms of why does a giraffe have to have the taste of the leaf rather than just eating it, there isn't an evolutionary explanation for that. 
Yeah, but tasting isn't consciousness, is it? Tasting I is tasting. But it's not I mean, spirit. smelling isn't consciousness. Can't be. But then, because I'm mental. Well, in that case, you're going to say pretty well every animal's conscious. I mean, because they're all not good at smelling, better than us. Oh. I mean, I mean, you know, smelling that way, not. Oh yeah, but way. we don't know that they're actually conscious of the smell. Do you see what I mean? They could be on automatic. This is the thing. Well, we have a God Almighty, I mean, they can tell one smell from another smell. Yeah, but they, I mean, they I might... Mean, it take, listen, I think, tell you what, there's more to it than that as well. You know they talk about um, dogs leaving messages? Yeah. Well, I, I would swear it's true with the male dogs, yeah? What do you mean, dogs leaving messages? Sorry, no, I well, I don't know. It's a euphemism for having a pee, but I oh, think right, it might right, be literally, tr literally true. Literally true. I would say that there's at least eight different things he can say with his wee. Really? Yeah, and he really thinks about it. Now he's got old. That's about the only interest he's got in life. <laughs> and he goes and he goes, thinks about things. He smells what's there, what's been left, and gives his reply. At least my dog's got some answers. Unlike the unsolved riddles revolving round my brain. Thinking about thinking is like trying to taste your own tongue. That is the big mystery, is it? That we, is. we cannot understand understanding. Exactly. We, we can come up with all these metaphors, yes. but we cannot begin to explain how electrical changes in a cell can produce this. I mean, yeah. And yeah, that's yeah. the that's extraordinary, extraordinary thing. Consciousness yeah. is a miracle. Absolutely. I think it's yes. the greatest miracle. Uh, it's the greatest achievement of nature. And yeah. You see, the, the fascinating thing about it is mm. that by, ev by evolving consciousness, nature has become conscious of itself. Where am I in my brain? <laughs> well, it's a very sophisticated question, you see, because that's quite a recent idea that you are in your brain. Oh, well, is it? Yeah, where, where, yeah. Would, where, oh, well, I mean, where would I the Greeks, I the early Greeks thought that you lived in your diaphragm. Really, did yeah, they? Yeah, the idea was your soul was your breath, and they knew that your diaphragm was what you used to bring in breath and let out oh, breath. Oh, I see, yes. And, and other people have thought that you exist in your heart. Many people believe that that's where you live. Mm. But it's only comparatively recently that we've decided that it's in the brain. So that's quite a sophisticated question. Whereabouts in your brain you exist? You live well. Descartes believed mm. you lived in the pineal gland. That that where was is the, where is the pineal that's right gland? in the middle, right in the centre of right in the centre of the brain. And is that many many people. The third eye? Well, many people have that feeling. But if you ask, if you ask, I mean, where do you think you live? Where do you feel you live? I thought it was further back. <laughs> I see. Well, it's many people close. feel that it is somewhere up, up there, you know. Yes. I, I remember when I was at Oxford, I used to go around asking people where they thought they lived. Yeah. And it, people said that it moved, what they were doing. For example, Oarsman said that when they were really struggling, really trying yes. hard, they were up here somewhere, in ah, the middle, behind right. their shoulders, right. you know. Yeah. Um, and uh, it, when your when the, your uh, jockeys said, well, you know, they they felt right up here somewhere, trying, and the, they they'd flow into the head of the horse, yeah, urging it to yeah, get its head yeah. beyond the winning post. Yeah. But the uh, the answer now, I think, is that uh, there is no centre. So there's no center of consciousness, no master control switch, and yet it can be switched on and off by chemicals. Leslie Bromley does it half a dozen times a day in her operating theatres. You would say, would you, uh, the anaesthetics relieve the patient of his consciousness? Yeah, patients become unconscious. They become unconscious, yes. yeah. But exactly how unconscious they are, I can't tell you. <laughs> Well, you mean it, it, they might, it might just be that their muscles aren't working? No, we do... Oh, there he is. Hello, he's the patient. I suppose this fellow's going to find out for himself. He looks like he could do with a belt of laughing gas to cheer him up. The reason why anaesthetics only tell us something about consciousness in the brain is because it's like trying to crack a walnut with a hammer. All we can say is it turns off jolly nearly everything. But anaesthetics are too crude a tool for us to say very much about consciousness, except that we can abolish it to all intents and purposes while you have your operation and you don't know where you've been, but I think you're still in there somewhere. 
You're just not talking to people. I'm always talking to people. Oh, yeah, hello, yes, Ken Campbell here. Next on my list is Richard Gregory. He's an inquirer into the nature of illusion. I arranged to meet him at his Bristol Exploratory. Why do we study illusions? Well, it's a bit bizarre, really, isn't it? We're trying to discover truth through illusion. Well, the reason really is this. You've got the physical world out there. We have to make the best guess we can, the best bet we can, or in my terminology, the best hypothesis of what is out there. Yeah. Now, when you get a difference, a discrepancy in error, it tells one what is happening within the brain. Oh, I see. So by seeing, seeing what it is that we're getting wrong, yes. we can see how we work. How we work. Exactly. Yeah. That's yeah. the point. So is this a meeting of minds or the outline of a mosque? And why am I seeing a triangle that doesn't really exist? What it seems to me is when I, uh, I look at something, say, say this puzzle here, mm. I'm seeing it with my eyes, so there's the picture that comes to my eyes, then it's uh, played maybe on a screen in there, and then there's some little, little, little geezer in there looking at, the, looking at the screen. That's me. So there's, it's that. It goes in through the eyes, it's on the screen, and reported to the little fellow in there. Mm. Well, we used to think that, but we no longer believe that's true. Right. Because if it were, you would have a screen, a sort of eye looking at the screen, another screen, another eye. Mm -hmm. It would go on forever and ever. That wouldn't get you anywhere. But we think now very differently that the brain um, is a bit like a novelist, and it's describing the world from different features. Like, say Sherlock Holmes. Let's take Sherlock Holmes. Yeah. There's a cigarette with a bit of lipstick on it. Yeah. Immediately he's got this idea, golly, there was a woman in the room, you know. They thought yeah. it was a man, no, it was a woman. Yeah. And then he reinterprets the evidence around him. Right, so for me, that's a duck. For me, there's the rabbit, and now it's a duck on its back. That's a rabbit on its back now. So, it's, so what's happening in my brain? Well, I think initially that's more likely to be a duck's bill because they're yeah. horizontal. Yeah. That's more likely to be a rabbit's ears because it's vertical. Right. But having said that, your brain yeah. can, as it were, entertain alternative hypotheses right. without rotating it. Will say, right. Well, golly, maybe it's a funny up way well, up just rabbit. Just a saying, no, just a moment, Watson, it could be a rabbit on its back. Exactly, exactly, which is always mm. a possibility. Yeah. And by the way, if we couldn't see unusual I see. So, things... So Watson would always think that was a rabbit. That's it. Well, the more imaginative what? your brain is, yes. artists, of course, particularly, the yeah. more alternatives you see. Yeah, but yeah. if you couldn't see alternative possibilities, you'd be blind to the unusual. Blind to the unusual. Not me, matey. It's almost a speciality. And I'll tell you what, there are people who are blind to the usual. After suffering a stroke, Peggy Palmer stopped seeing things on her left-hand side. There's nothing wrong with her eyes. It's just that her brain ignores half the story. So when she draws something, she thinks she's finished when she's only drawn half of it. So you, you, you don't have in your brain the bit that appreciates left-hand right, sides. Yeah. See, we've got pictures, haven't we? Yeah. The brain tells you what you're looking at. It tells you that's a table, that's a well, chair. When you look at yourself in the mirror, is there a side of you that you don't see? I don't see? see this side. Derek had to tell me to do this side this morning. Really? I put my makeup on that if, side. If, if, if it's pointed out to you that there is another side, oh, yeah. then you can do it. Yeah. Be, but automatically, yeah. You, you just wouldn't it's think It's an automatic thing. Brain works on right. its own. You don't. Uh, you don't uh, uh. You've got to be aware of. You've got to be on your toes all the time. You've got to be aware of everything all the time. I see. So if you if you if you actually pay attention, mm. then you could do then anything. Then I can do it. Yeah. Yeah. Right. That's right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's the hub of the matter in some respect. Attention yeah, is the problem. Yeah. You can devote mm -hmm. your attention. If I ask you to look to your left, you can look to your left. But mm -hmm. automatically, you should be looking to your left when normal stimuli mm -hmm. are there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. What Peggy does is has to use that o that non-automatic system to direct attention over to the left. That's for tiring for, auto for automatic that's, that's activity. Right. That's tiring. Yeah. Therefore, after a while, with reading especially, yeah. you have great difficulties. You miss yeah. out lots of words, and in mm -hmm. writing as well, yeah. you have difficulties mm -hmm. there. I don't as well. see the um, words. So, so yeah, when you read, words, I don't see. Uh, you don't see little words. Don't but when you're reading, see, you, you, I, you read I the whole page. If I look at a word, I only see half the word. I don't see the, the 
left hand yeah, side yeah. of the word and I, my brain works out the word on its own like a word like heading yeah you um, just see ding I see leading my oh, brain see. says leading you know right, and right. I'm reading all the wrong words all the time because yeah. I'm only reading half a word you know and it's very frustrating trying to read a book it's very frustrating you I'm get a completely different story I think yes, sometimes yeah. <laughs> I mean, the thing about Peggy that's interesting is that the brain's kind of filling in. The brain, if the brain can't make sense of it, it has a guess. And that kind of shows what's going on the whole time in the brain. Is that there's this kind of... Well, yeah, okay. I mean, I, I don't think that's what I found. It seemed like... It wasn't. Yeah, no. It, you most, know? Of, most of the time it isn't. But what's important about this is it shows that all of us in our brains... Yeah have so much that's going on before the, we're actually told about it consciously. And some people think that this is kind of an explanation of consciousness, because, you know... Which part where is an explanation of consciousness? Well, the fact that there's kind of all this guesswork, it's like a game of charades underneath the conscious level. Yeah. Yeah, so kind of, you know, neurons are guessing, right? Yeah. And then they kind of come to a decision, maybe, you know, by whatever, whichever guess seems to be the best. And then you become conscious of it. Do you see what I mean? Yeah. Well, like a committee decision. So, okay, folks, we're calling it a table. Okay. We'll call this a ball. We'll call this a cube. Okay. Well, look, it must be a game of pool. I think it's your go. I think a little thought experiment might be in order. Let's suppose I could see the deliberations of my homes like mind. You know when you hear a sound, say it's a rumbling, rolling kind of sound, your brain starts a guessing game, and you're not even aware it's playing. It comes up with a number of hypotheses for what could be making that sound. Skateboard homes? I don't think so, Watson. Rollerblading then, homes. Hmm. Possibly. It's only when the brain's decided that the answer arrives in our consciousness. No, I fancy it's a shopping trolley, Watson, led by a portly gentleman. What's the matter, Watson? I've been demoted. I used to think I was in charge in my own brain. But now it seems that I'm just one of the many things that my brain does. And then, think, uh, fruity, uh, Gregory, Richard Gregory, tells me that half the time things are being done and decisions made in there and I'm only being told about it afterwards, you know? Like I'm some kind of Ronald Reagan presidency. But I don't... I don't see how or where these decisions are made. How come I need to be conscious anyway? I've been reading a book called Journey to the Centres of the Mind by an Oxford neuroscientist called Susan Greenfield. Apparently this lady was chopping up a brain when she got a sliver caught under her fingernail. She began to wonder what that bit did. Was it the bit that loved Beethoven? The memory of a particular summer day? Or the bit that would make someone fidget when speaking? You know, five years ago, if a scientist said they are interested in consciousness, they'd have been regarded as some kind of loony. Unperturbed, Susan Greenfield developed her own theory about how neurons created thoughts. She became the Gresham Professor of Physic. So who better to ask where consciousness begins and ends? I think the happiest way of looking at it, and one that would answer this riddle, mm. is to say of saying consciousness is not all or none. Consciousness is not like a light switch suddenly going on. Mm. Think of it as something that grows as brains grow. It's a continuum. It's like a dimmer switch. So you can have more or less consciousness. If you think of it like that, mm -hmm. then we could explain, I think, or at least understand whether a fetus is conscious or not. Because I would say, yes, as the brain gets more sophisticated, it's growing in the womb, mm -hmm. gradually consciousness will grow and develop. And if that's the case, then that also, I think, helps with animal consciousness. Because, again, people say, well, come on, a rat's not as conscious as Van Gogh was, let's mm -hmm. say. But, on the other hand, 
most people don't like to think of animals as just little automata. It's very hard to think of a chimpanzee as an automata, or your pet mm. dog if you've got one, or your cat as an automata. Mm. Intuitively, one feels there is some kind of consciousness there, but different from ours. And I think the yeah. way the difference resides in quantity. Now, if we start thinking of consciousness as a continuum, as a kind of dimmer switch, yeah. then for me as a neuroscientist, that gets around a huge problem, because it's a problem of quantity, not quality. But even on a dimmer switch, there's completely yeah. off that's completely and, and off. full. That's, yeah, absolutely. Now, completely off, and I think we ought to distinguish this, is between, yeah. imagine a stone. A stone yeah. is never, ever, ever going to be conscious. It's not a, a living thing. But I think even the humblest animal, anything with the vestige of a nervous system, would be at that very, very end yeah. of the continuum, yes, with the potential. The next mystery I wanted her to tackle was, where is the me bit of the brain, the little geezer at the epicentre of all consciousness? I can tell you that there is no such thing as a centre for consciousness, no. much as though, intuitively, it would be the easiest way of thinking of that. Well, is that because so, it comes about by the connections? Well, my view is that, yes, that it comes that the connections are important, just like the overall um, sound from an orchestra is more important than the individual players. Mm -hmm. something you can't pin down to each individual player. I think consciousness mm -hmm. arises from the net interaction of lots of different brain regions rather than being in one. Now, according to my theory, my particular theory, what would correlate with consciousness are different sizes of neurons grouping up together, forming assemblies or having parties, if you like. But, yeah. um, and these groups of neurons are not fixed, but every second they're changing, like blobs of mercury or like clouds. Yeah. Can you imagine groups yeah. forming and reforming? Yeah. And the bigger the group, the deeper your consciousness, the smaller the group, the shallower for that time, or yeah. blunted your consciousness. Is there only one group, or are there several well, groups think, at the same time? Well, I think they're trying to form at the same time. There's several groups all jostling, trying to form, but at any yeah. one time there'll be one dominant one. The yeah. biggest one will dominate. Would you call that dominant one me? Am I, the, am I my dominant group? Is that who I am? No, I think, well, that's your consciousness, yes. Right. Uh, but I think one can... So I can't help but focus on the dominant group. Well, that is you. You can't think of it as two ways. You can't say, I can't help but focus. That dominant group is your consciousness. It is your consciousness. It's not you focusing on it. It's that is my it is you. It's one on the same but thing. Meanwhile, meanwhile, there's a smaller group that's formed. Trying to, yeah, 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 like trying then, to elbow that one out of the way. Right, and then if that was totally that's, right. that's me changing my, my mind. Yes, that's right. Well, consciousness is changing all the time. Every second, yeah. your consciousness is changing. So it's all down to raving neurons. It's not that I'm invited to the party, I am the party. Okay, so let's check this out. Pain. How come sometimes it hurts and sometimes it doesn't? You see, when my mate Travis is in the ring, he doesn't feel pain. No matter how hard his neurons are knocked. It's not a pain. The adrenaline's been pronounced so much. It's like a shock. It's like getting hit. Uh, you shake it off. If we, if we were to compare, like, one single blow that you, you might get in the ring, with you just getting it socially, sort of out of the blue when you weren't expecting it... That'd hurt. That would hurt. It, it would hurt. Right, but so in the ring... Not to that extent. Yeah. No, no, no it's, it's not that I'm um, oblivious to pain. It's just, um, my own opinion is the adrenaline's pumping around so fast, um, you receive a shot, can't think, wow, that hurt, and dwell on the pain. It's like a shock. It's like, boom. Yeah. Um, it shakes you, um, it dazes you, yeah. but it doesn't hurt. It's not right. a pain. I think that obviously the nerves that are carrying the signals about pain mm -hmm. up into the brain, mm -hmm. they haven't changed. But what changes, I think, is the size of the neuronal assembly, the, the group that's recruited to be conscious of that pain. Mm -hmm. um, well, it must be, it's very small if it isn't hurting. Exactly, it's just because it, you're distracted by something else, you see? That's All the whole right. point. The assembly can't form because it's been jostled out by something else, yes. When you're up there, does it always seem to be going fast? It's always going fast. The only time that it's not going fast um, is when you receive a real big blow. And yeah. you see, it seems so, everything seems to go in slow motion. Well, really? as it comes, it Yeah, it's really? very strange, it's what? real strange. Really? It's like a car crash, I've, I've, I've heard it many yeah, times. Yeah, no, I've heard it with a car crash. I've never, it's never happened to me, such a yeah. thank God. That's right, the last bit, before you but actually it, get to the train. It all seems slow and you think, I know I'm going to crash and you seem to clench your body yeah. just as you're going to uh, crash. It's exactly the same with the shot. You can see the shot coming yeah. and you are you know it's coming and yeah. you know you're going to get hit. And yeah. you think, that's going to hit and all of a sudden, bump. And it seems it seems 10 minutes. So that's the strange thing. It seems like it's coming forever. And you think, yeah. I should move. Why aren't you moving? All of a sudden. I suppose Greenfield's theory can explain this too. 
his time slows down because the thought of the approaching blow creates such a huge party of neurons, a kind of Neuronberg rally that takes ages to disperse, whereas normally the brain hosts lots of small parties, more like Cynthia Payne. I like this explanation of consciousness. It seemed to me to answer all the problems. But apparently it doesn't satisfy philosopher Galen Strawson. Is that a definition, maybe, of philosophers? Them that are never satisfied. At the end of time, they'll still have a nickel. Susan Greenfield seemed to think that we could explain consciousness by um, neurons and the way that, that neurons would uh, jump into d different systems of connection with each other. Yeah, I don't think I hold any view that's incompatible with what she thinks mm. because I agree with her that somehow or other consciousness is just a matter of whatever these waves of electrochemical activation sweeping across mm. groups of neurons. Mm. But I don't think that explains consciousness. I mean, suppose, suppose you looked at a red, a red wall yes. and, and we were scanning your brain at the same time and afterwards we could say, Here's the whole, maybe we could sort of rerun a picture of your brain in action. Mm. And we'd say, that was your scanning the red wall. It was these neurons doing that. Yeah. So we, what, what we can correlate sensory experiences, like seeing a red wall, with certain patterns of brain yeah. activation. We can get correlations, but correlations aren't explanations. Yeah. And Susan Greenfield, that more than once in her book, says that we haven't a clue why it is that neurons doing this is you're having the experiences you have when you look at a red wall. Mm -hmm. She thinks she knows what it is, what consciousness is, in terms of neurons, but she doesn't know how uh, consciousness arises. That would be. Yeah. There's a sense in which we haven't yet got an explanation at all, and it's not even clear where we would begin to look to find one. The difficult part of the problem of consciousness is not you know, the higher cognitive human stuff, self-consciousness and the ability to do mathematics and things. Mm. The really difficult part comes right at the beginning and it's sensory experience. So, you know, dogs famously have an incredible sense of smell and there's something it's like experientially for them to smell things. So the what it's likeness, the something, the what it's, like the something it's like, yeah. Or the right. feely, the feely. Right, so maybe we use the word consciousness to mean the what it's like. Uh, yeah, that's, I think that's the, the most common use nowadays, yeah. I'm still not sure I've got my head round this what it's likeness business. Perhaps my cordless brain can help me run another thought experiment. Let's suppose I could disconnect my brain and hook it up to one of those kids. What would it be like to be 14 again? Well, it's not exactly like I supposed it would be. My brain is connected to this boy, but I'm not experiencing the what it's likeness to be him because I'm not inside his brain. I'm only experiencing the what it's likeness to be inside his body with my brain. I wonder what it's like to be a dog. To me it feels like I'm the nasty force in the evil dead. But I doubt that's how dogs feel, otherwise it would be very bad news for the postman. My brain can't smell the things normal dogs can smell. I couldn't make any sense of that message. I think I'd better get reconnected to the old Campbell body before someone tampers with it. Yeah. You see, you can't, you can't actually find out what it's like to be like a dog. You can have a dog's eye view, but you never get. You can never get to the what it's likeness to be a dog. Yeah, I, well, you see, that's when, when you get back to the animals again, I think. It's, it's the, the what it's likeness, I mean, the what, the what it's likeness for you yeah. <clears throat> of being hurt, uh, of, of, of experiencing pain, is likely to be different from the what it's likeness of, 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 of um, pain for a newt. Sure. But that's probably, I mean, but, if, but it, if but we I mean, buy you know, the fact that the thing doesn't like it shows it's, it's got some kind of what it's likeness. Yeah. And what it doesn't likeness.
Yeah, but I mean, then presumably, because newts have got different chemicals, they've got different what it's likeness. Yeah. But just saying, if a scientist says, oh, look, this chemical in the newt is newt experience, yeah. doesn't give us a clue what it's like for the newt. If they said, oh, it's thalamamine rather than dopamine or something yeah. in the newt, yeah. it gives it a different experience. Would that give us any insight at all into what it's like to be a newt? It wouldn't. A physical explanation isn't enough because it doesn't bridge the link between the what it's likeness, the mental experience, and the chemical maybe, reaction. Maybe if we took a bit of thalamine, it would. <laughs> so traditional science can't bridge the gap between the physical and the what it's likeness. It just can't explain how matter can have mental properties. Perhaps you have to go back to the ancient Greeks for an explanation. There's another doctrine, actually, called panpsychism, where everything's conscious, like billiard ball, uh, that's conscious, this goo's conscious, the rest is conscious, the, the table has got its own table. Oh, God, consciousness. The doctrine of panpsychism reckons that there's something it's like to be everything, even a stone, however yeah. rudimentary it is. Yes. <laughs> I think I've found out what I am. <laughs> Psychic. Well, it's yeah. actually a it's a serious yeah. candidate for the, yeah, pro I mean, the problem. Every, of every atom and every quark. Well, yeah, exactly. The, the, the problem of consciousness is so difficult. Yeah. Yeah. The problem of consciousness is so difficult that panpsychism is actually has to be one of the contenders. If it were true, it would it would seem to be able to provide an explanation of how consciousness can arise from the physical as we know it yeah. through physics. Because if consciousness is in there right at the start, right at the ground level, yeah. then perhaps we can see why a brain, which, is, which we think of as just a very complex physical thing, yeah. as being able to have complex conscious states because consciousness was always there right from the start. Yeah. So panpsychism has got a, a kind of good, a lead on all the other theories in terms of making it, making it possible for us to understand how consciousness could be just physical. Yeah. But, unfortunately, we have no reason to believe it to be true apart from that. I don't know. I could see the appeal of panpsychism, but I wasn't about to become one of Pan's people. I couldn't believe that any old physical thing was conscious, although we all agreed my grey matter is. Even philosophers seem to accept that my mind is physical. So I am just physical. That's what I think. And nothing more. Yeah, nothing more, but nothing less either. I mean, I mean, part of the point of this is that the physical, if consciousness is physical, then the physical is a lot more than you thought it was. So what are you lacking? But what that means is that you're going to have to expand your, your idea of what the physical is enormously. Physics is more than just the matter of atoms bumping into each other. Uh -huh. or, or rather, it may be just a matter of atoms bumping into each other, but atom, atoms bumping into each other um, produces or includes the phenomenon of consciousness and everything that you hold dear. Right. <laughs> so it's all physical. Everything mental is in fact physical, except there are some things you might say about that, but then that's all physical too. It's just maybe some sort of physical we don't know fully about yet. And I thought, is this, I mean, my porridge, my porridge in the morning, that's physical and chemical, but it doesn't really have any good thoughts. Whereas in there, that's physical, that's chemical, but it does think, I mean, I must have put itself together really craftily. You know, there are people who think they can solve the mystery of consciousness by building a conscious robot. There's even someone who believes he is a robot. See me in America next week. And you can join Ken Campbell next Sunday at the same time of 9 o'clock. Also, you might like to know that there's an edited transcript of all the brain spotting programs with additional information on the mysterious world of consciousness in a Channel 4 booklet. It's priced £3.50, and to order your copy, send a cheque or postal order, payable to Channel 4, to Brainspotting, PO Box 4000, London W5 2GH.